but I want to say welcome. Welcome to Reno, Nevada. Um, hopefully you get to experience other people from our university, which again is a great university, great place to be. And I hope that you leave here more inspired than when you came. Thank you very much for joining us and have a great conference. Thank you, Jane Easton Brooks. Your support is greatly appreciated. So I'm going to introduce both plenary speakers uh, and, and they have a great uh, a, a surprise for you, but I won't tell you. <laughs> um, so Mitchell Nathan is from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's a fellow of the International Society of the Learning Sciences. He founded AERA Division C, section in engineering and CS education. He is an inductee of the University of Wisconsin Teaching Academy, which promotes um, excellence in education. And there, there's longer biographies that you can download from the all academic website. So I'm making it, uh, giving some highlights, but you can read the full biography online. So thank you very much. And now I will hand it to the two great speakers. Greetings, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here at PME NA 45, to see old friends and colleagues, to meet new friends and colleagues. So I'm really excited to be here. And Taruni, thank you for all the amazing organization. And Dean Eastman, I couldn't have asked for a better like frame or setup because I really going to embrace that very view that you expressed about your son, about how some people are of math. They're of a world in math. And I want to say, welcome to the world of mathematics. And what's amazing about the world of mathematics is virtually anything is possible in this world. And explore now what the implications are for math education of that premise. Because we also sit within a cultural view that mathematics is difficult, that mathematics is out of reach, that mathematics is other. And I want to share like a common kind of cultural, you know, influence here. Right? This is a very pervasive view, and of course presented in the form of a of a doll um, for kids, for mostly uh, girls to play with, and for uh, a variety of reasons, we have a sense that uh, we should portray math as somehow difficult or out of reach. Um, but what is it that makes mathematics tough? Well, mathematics is disembodied. It's arbitrary. It's amodal, meaning it does not contain sensorial informations or indicators of sensorial triggers. Uh, it's abstract. It is meant to be very uh, non-concrete. And so um, this is a wonderful thing. This is a wonderful thing for people who understand what this field does and what this system does because it offers a formal system with powerful rules for modeling an enormous range of patterns, patterns that are both physical and real, and patterns that are imagined. And it is also terrible for students in many regards. Many students struggle to get that sense of what mathematics is saying because the ways it expresses this information is outside of our embodied experiences. It is detached from the real world uh, that we operate in. It is non-sensorial, it is disembodied. And so when we want to understand some of the key concepts of mathematics, um, we just do things in the world, right? We do, for example, sharing, and we have a sense of what it means to share something fairly. And in mathematics, 
we portray this in this like really abstract kind of way that is supposed to capture something. We're supposed to gain some sense of understanding of this and be able to port this idea from one context to another. Um, but what happens here is that we're giving a system that is not designed with the embodied experiences we have in mind at its, at its root. So I'm motivated, I'm really driven by a value, and that value is that all educational experiences should be meaningful to all learners. All of our students should come away with mathematical ideas, what mathematical notations and symbols mean. And when we put symbols and formalisms in between those ideas and our own experiences, we, we work against that, um, that goal of being meaningful. So there are ethical reasons and cognitive reasons for why I'm motivated by this, um, this value. And the ethical reasons are that I see educational institutions as charged with the responsibility that they should be improving the lives of learners and improving their futures. And the cognitive reasons are that we know that when things are meaningful, they are better understood, comprehended, they're better retained, and they're more readily applied when they're appropriate. So I call this connection between our lived, felt, sensory experience, our movements, our perceptions, as achieving a grounded understanding of mathematics. And that is the basis on which a lot of mathematics learning and thinking happen. And it sounds like that's really the experience that <laughs> your son has, that, that these things just make sense and can uh, just relate to uh, the perceptual and felt experiences of his life. And I want to like extend that. So what does it mean to have grounded mathematical ideas? So consider uh, students exploring ideas of triangles and using their entire bodies to think about the relationships of two sides to the space between those two sides as they're made with one's hands and exploring things like the triangle inequality theorem by understanding how the lengths of the two sides of a triangle relate to the length of a third side. This is what I mean by uh, grounded understanding of mathematical ideas. So the point I want to make is that our students, our learners, and us reside in the real world. When we think about mathematical ideas, when we think about objects, when we think about mathematical relationships, we think about them in terms of the kinds of things they offer us experientially. So thinking about something like equivalence as balance, right, and using that as a grounding concept for understanding how equivalence portrays itself across a variety of other contexts. Even when we imagine those ideas outside of the context of performing them, we still reactivate and reinvoke those same neural experiences that we have when we experience them perceptually and motorically. So this is what happens when we perform what I call grounded and embodied mathematics. And this is the natural mathematics that we all do. When people say things like, I don't understand why it's so hard for you to learn mathematics because you're doing it all the time. What people are doing is they're doing grounded and embodied mathematics. And what we ask people to engage in is ungrounded embodied mathematics, ungrounded, disembodied. We take those qualities from this unreal world that is full of symbols and full of diagrams that are presented in these amodal and abstract forms, and we ask students to gain mastery of those things, right? So let's just explore an example. You'll, you'll just do this where you're sitting. Um, mathematics is, is supposed to be a tool for reasoning and problem solving. But it sometimes makes us kind of disconnected from the way we want to reason about things. So consider this problem, and some of you may have come across this before. But consider the story problem of a bat and a ball that costs a dollar ten total. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. Just shout out, what, how much is the ball? I'm hearing what? Yes? Five cents? What else? Ten cents I'm hearing? I'm hearing all sorts of answers. 
I don't know why I'm hearing more than one answer, right? Math is math, right? We should come up with one answer. But it's tempting to say 10 cents until you realize that if, if it's a 10 cents, then the difference between a dollar 10 and 10 cents, right? The, the, if, it's, if the bat then is a dollar, then the difference is only 90 cents, right? So it has to be five cents and a dollar five. Mathematics can trip us up sometimes, even though it's a very powerful tool. So when we teach mathematics, we're really asking two things of students. We're asking that they master the formalisms that describe the objects and their behaviors in the ungrounded embodied mathematical realm. And we ask them to become residents of this unreal world so that ungrounded and embodied mathematics has meaning for students. And what's problematic here is we, we want both those things, but we really ignore the second and only support the first. We spend a lot of time mas on mastery of formalisms without really a sense of how it becomes a meaningful system for the learners so that they feel, even if temporarily, residents of the unreal world of mathematics. So how can we prepare students to be tourists of this unreal world. So Barbie can help us, perhaps. Barbie's all set to take us on a tour of the unreal world. So I want to express that there is a body of research that suggests three general ways of doing this. And there are more. But this is three really well-supported approaches that have a lot um, to offer educational practices and the design of instructional experiences. One we can broadly call progressive formalizations. So this includes things like realistic mathematics program and concreteness fading, right? So let's look at concreteness fading. Concreteness fading is a really interesting approach. It actually was originally introduced by Jerome Bruner, uh, and it's been developed over a number of studies. Emily Fife's work is an excellent example of this work. Um, it builds on our natural ability to incrementally shift from real world experiences to more and more idealized versions of those experiences, right? So starting with a scale and then stripping away over time the procedural and motoric elements of it so that we get more and more idealized and more and more abstracted, right? Until we can finally express this in a version of like pure symbols, pure abstraction. What's key is not just jumping from one to the other but going through that progression so that students understand how each one grounds on the prior set of experiences that they have, and each one is solidified as a meaningful way to depict some kind of mathematical relationship. A second way that we can be tourists in this unreal world is through professional vision. So this is work really inspired by Chuck Goodwin uh, in his work in uh, anthropology. Professional vision is when we actually uh, scaffold changes in the perceptual performance of people so that within the real world they see the mathematical uh, uh, relationships um, as they come at them. They, they learn to shift their actual perceptual experiences um, and see um, a phenomena in the real world through the lens of ungrounded embodied mathematics. So I want to share a video from a project. Um, uh, Candace Walkington here has been very, was very generous to share. Um, this wonderful project uh, called WalkSTEM, and there's TalkSTEM. Um, these are ways of bringing this kind of view of mathematics into children's world through their day-to-day -day lives where they really start to see and talk about mathematics. The big number. But why do you think we call it the big number? Not sure yet? Look closer. You can see lots of squares on the floor, and inside the squares are smaller squares. I know a strategy. We can estimate. We can use what we see to make a good guess. We can also multiply using the array model. There are seven number of squares that go on top and 29 that go on the side. We can see that there are 
232 big squares. Wow, it's a big number. Now you know why we call it the big number room. Right, both adorable and super insightful, right? Um, a third way of helping people be tourists in the unreal world of mathematics is through the immersion of micro-worlds, creating worlds, often through technology, that has the objects of the unreal world of mathematics in them. We arrive in that micro-world where all the objects are, are uh, set so that they only follow the rules of ungrounded and embodied mathematics. You can't violate the rules of mathematics in these worlds, right? You come and you join them and you operate within those, those rules. So learners operate there in spaces where the objects behave according to those rules. We develop our perceptual, our motoric um, skills around those things. We start to internalize those and we start to realize how those uh, rules apply. So here's an example. Uh, this one is, there's numerous cases of this. Um, I think of uh, Natalie Sinclair's work uh, with touch math. Um, this is out of the Graspable Math Project. All these touches and, and sensorial moves all follow rules of mathematics around orders of operations and nesting and principles of fractions and algebra. And children gain amazing uh, access to these mathematical ideas. Another way we can do this is uh, through a project uh, that uh, Candice Walkington and I are doing, um, and this is a video from her lab, um, using the emerging system of the augmented reality version of GeoGebra. So these students are all wearing uh, these headsets and they're experiencing these holographic objects within their regular spaces that they're operating in. They obviously can see each other. We're getting a view from their, one of the students' lenses. And here, they're creating objects, geometric objects, with geometric properties. They can't violate those rules, but they can operate with them and understand them and explore the regularities of those objects. And one of the amazing things was a student in this who's in a high school program uh, designed to help students who would be first generation college attending has this fabulous experience and relates to the group. If they bring virtual reality into school, I am definitely going to come to college here. I'm coming to college here. I also want to point out that even when we create these opportunities, we always remain citizens of the real world. There's always some distance here. There's always some way that we are rooted in our embodied experience trying to reason about a system that is disembodied. So numbers for us are locations in space. Operations are physical actions. Limits are fictive motion that never ends. Sets are containers that have idealized properties and so on and on. And that is really important to realize because when we go to reason about things, we have to remember that we are like in a world and we're like visiting another world. So I wanna do this audience participation. You can do this one by yourself. You could also turn to a neighbor. It's a really fun one to do with a neighbor. I want you to imagine one of the most familiar objects that we have in our culture, a cube. And I think of like one foot by one foot by one foot cube. Imagine a cube suspended by a string at one of its corners so that its most distance, distant corner is vertically below it. And now, this is, you can turn to your neighbor, or you can do this by yourself. Point to the spatial locations of the other corners of that cube while it is dangling in this configuration. So here's a little visual cue for you. Yeah, I'm watching. I wish I was videotaping you all. <coughs> What's that? What? Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> 
So let me bring you back. Let me bring you back. By a show of hands, by a show of hands, how many of you found the four remaining corners? I think you found the four remaining corners. Okay, I want everybody to look around and see the hands. High, high up, come on, be proud. Four remaining corners, okay. How many of you found the six remaining corners? Right? Cubes have eight corners. If we counted for two of them, there's six remaining ones. And despite what many people think, including you all, who have some serious math cred, right? They are not in a plane, right? They're in this odd angle. All I did, in fact, this is a task that Jeff Hinton first came up with in the late 70s. All I asked you to do was take a really regular object and put it in a kind of irregular orientation. And it was fine for some of you, but it totally overwhelmed many of your abilities to reason about it. We have to remember we always have at least a foot in the real world. Look at this case. This isn't so much audience participation. I think you'll take this in. This is wonderful work by Rob Goldstone, David Landy, and G. Sun. So we think of algebraic symbol manipulations as, as, as movements, as operators. And when we have these bands going behind them that operate either consistently to the direction of those algebraic movements or against it, um, it actually impairs people's ability to do this symbol manipulation. Why? Symbol manipulation is this purely symbolic, purely semantic, purely cognitive operation. But we have these perceptual qualities that we project onto it. And when people perceive these objects and imagine their behaviors and project these real world interactions, we have this collision. And it either slows us down or actually causes us to make errors. So I tried to keep this at a very high level. And I really use it to help generate lots of conversation about how we should be thinking about mathematics and the learning and the thinking that goes on around mathematics. When we are embodied, grounded agents trying to understand this other realm. So I described the two worlds, our real world of our embodied lives and the unreal world of ungrounded mathematics. And I shared examples of why learning is hard. We're asking residents of the real world to operate as residents of the unreal world. And there are methods to move forward. There are ways of making bridges between these two worlds through grounded and embodied mathematics education practice. Students' educational experiences should and can be meaningful. Thank you. So, I want to just point out my many colleagues from the Magic Lab at the University of Wisconsin, my wonderful colleagues at Southern Methodist University, and my lovely colleague, Taruni, who also organized this. And, and we work together on the Nevada Mathematics Project. Thank you very much. And now some questions. <laughs> also, this QR code, this will take you to uh, my lab website, where there's lots of these papers and some videos.